It's our 20th anniversary year, and we recently made the decision to change our name, to officially change our name, from the Alabama Poverty Project to Alabama Possible. We did this in the belief that not only does our name better reflect the hope with which we fulfill our mission of helping people lift themselves out of poverty, but also because in the past two decades we have seen the positive results of our work, namely in Alabama possible. Um, I would be remiss now if I did, did not take a moment here to recognize those who have helped us take this organization so far, our board members. So at this time, if you are a board member, past or present, please stand so that you may be recognized. In addition, I want to recognize Christina Scott, who probably just sat down to have a bite to eat, our executive director. Christina has been with us five years now and truly is the driving force behind all we do. She's passionate and committed to a better Alabama and exemplifies this passion in all she does. Thank you, Christina. Before we move to the discussion part of the evening, John is going to take a moment to recognize our honorees. Thank you, Joyce. Mason Davis and Judge Scott Dow were born in segregated Alabama two years and 60 miles apart. Their backgrounds are rigidly different yet surprisingly similar. And as you'll hear in just a few minutes, both have spent their careers fighting for justice in many, many forms. Mr. Davis and Judge Val, for your many contributions to our city, our community, and our nation, and for sharing your stories with us tonight, please accept our thanks.
practiced there from 1933 until he died, died early, 1945. He would come down to Birmingham on the LN train. Y'all remember what the LN was? He'd come down to Birmingham once a month on the LN train. He'd leave his office on Friday, Friday afternoon. He'd get down here on Saturday morning and he would go to the office. Our family had two visitors a funeral home, Davenport and Harris, and an insurance company protected industrial, and he would go and he'd work all day. All day Saturday, he'd go and work half day Sunday, he'd come home and he would eat because we always ate Sunday, Sunday meals around 2 o'clock. He'd eat that and then he would go back to the l &M station and get on the train and go back to Cincinnati. He'd get there the next morning at 7 o'clock and he'd go to his office. And he started working at 8 o'clock. I thought that that was a great thing. <laughs> you know, lot's changed since then. Alabama during that period of time. 
that was in Tuscaloosa. It is still the only state-supported law. There are other private laws. Samford, Cumberland, uh, it's a part of Samford, Jones, Birmingham. All of those are private law schools. But at, if you went to school at, at the University of Alabama, once you graduated, you were what was known then as pass on privilege. You were given your license as a lawyer in the state of Alabama just because you had graduated from the University of Alabama. I had graduated from the State University of New York. There were others who had graduated from Harvard, Yale. We had to go in and get to take an examination. But in order to get to that point, the state paid me the difference in the cost of attending the University of Alabama as a resident of the state of Alabama and the cost of going to the State University of New York. Plus, they gave me train fare up there in September and train fare to come back in June. They didn't give me any any portion of the, uh, yes they did, they paid a portion of, of my room and board. But that was, that was also another insulting situation. Now, Judge Fowler, you too went to an out-of-state law school. Uh, what was that? Well, Mason and I sort of had uh, the reverse image of what was going on at the time. I was uh, an undergrad at Auburn. And the dean of the College of Liberal Arts was a friend of ours, and he had heard about a program that the legislature, the General Assembly of Virginia, had just put into effect. They thought that there were too many Yankees at the University of Virginia Law School. <laughs> so the legislature created scholarships for white boys from each of the former Confederate states. <laughs> well, I won one of those scholarships from Alabama, and that meant that I could go to law school at Charlottesville with less money than it would cost me to go to Tuscaloosa. And as an Auburn man, I wasn't too eager to go down <laughs> So uh, I was sort of also uh, Affirmative action. <laughs> but one of the problems with it, though, was that we were caught up in this scheme of the Alabama grads having automatic admission to the bar. Those of us who went to law school out of state had to take the bar. And I think that one of the primary purposes of the bar exam was to bar African Americans from becoming lawyers. Right. So we were all terrified. There were five of us. We were going to get caught up in that net. Uh, they swore that the testing uh, procedures were anonymous, but the president of the state bar called me before the official results were announced and said, Scott, I just want to tell you you've already passed the bar. So I don't think they were anonymous. <laughs> Jefferson's own rooms for two years in the West Branch was heated by a log burning fireplace. And it was a great experience. And you said before you were very much a child of your era, and yet you went through somewhat of a, a change in your attitude for the beauty in which you live and what was going on. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I finished high school in 55, so we were of the Eisenhower generation. And my generation, and there are not many of you who are still here, uh, we had no idea that we could question parents or teachers or the way things were. This was before the 60s. And we did what we were told to do. And uh, my uh, education in Alabama uh, was totally and completely segregated from the day we started first grade until, uh, until the day 
day I graduated from law school. And I am ashamed to say we didn't think anything about it. We didn't think we could do anything about it. And it wasn't until the 60s yet that we realized there was something that could be done. Uh, I, I just think that that's, we accepted it because that's the way things were. And I'm sorry that that uh, is the way it was. When you first got out of law school, it was pretty pivotal in that transition, world, right? It was. I went with a small firm. Some of you may have heard of Mr. Roderick Beto. He was a great trial lawyer. He was a friend of Clarence Darrow. Um, and so I toted his briefcase for several years. And he was, uh, in many ways, ahead of his time. We, we didn't have a segregated waiting room. Uh, we represent a lot of people who were victims of full time police brutality. And uh, on Monday mornings in our office in the Massey building, it was just filled with people who had been uh, mistreated. So uh, I think that representing those people and just seeing the inherent unfairness of the system we were dealing with uh, caused me to reassess all of that and to change the way I was. Mr. Davis, um, access to justice to the court system has changed considerably during your career. Tell me a little bit about one of the early cases you had representing civil rights administrators. Well, I passed the bar and was issued my license in April of 1960. The next year, 1961, was when the sit-in demonstration began. They began first in Greensboro, North Carolina. Then they moved over from Greensboro to Nashville. And from Nashville, they came down to Huntsville. I practiced with two other lawyers, Orzell Billingsley and Peter Hall. We were hired by a group of folks in Huntsville to come and represent over 100 black students from the high school. The high school's name was Trenum. Trenum High School, Alabama A&M College, Oakwood College. They had gone down to a drugstore in the middle of town. Huntsville was a very small town during that period of time. It was a cotton town. There was a drugstore that was known as the Terry Hutchins Walgreen Drugstore. The kids came down, they went to the drugstore, and they would sit and they would attempt to order a hamburger and a Coca-Cola. The waitresses had been put on notice that if they came in to alert the police, and the police would come and they would arrest the students. The charge was trespass after warning. I don't know how you can trespass after warning, but they were arrested for trespass after being warned by the waitress not to come in and walk, not to sit down. So they went to jail, over a hundred of them. Orzell, Pete, and I would drive up to Huntsville every morning. We would try maybe 10, 15 of them every morning in the city court. The judge's name was Horace Gall. I'll never forget it. <laughs> the little city court was upstairs in a building that you had to go up the outside steps to get into the courtroom. Now this wasn't like the movies were here where blacks had to go up the steps to get to the balcony. Everybody went up the outside steps to get to the city court in Huntsville. But we tried all those cases and as you can imagine, we lost every one of them. 
we appeal the cases to the circuit court, and the circuit court had been, uh, there was a new circuit judge there. He had been the state senator, and his name was David Arch. He's a pretty good guy. But he had been appointed by John Patterson, and he knew that he had his marching order to uh, find all of those students guilty. We tried over 100 cases there. After that, we made an agreement with the district attorney to take one case as a test case. And we appealed the case down to the Alabama Court of Appeals. Lawyers here, young lawyers, don't know about the Alabama Court of Appeals because that was during the period before the court had been divided. There was no court of civil appeals and there was no court of criminal appeals. This was the court of appeals and it was presided over by a woman. Her name was Annie Lola Price. She got all one, well, she got that one case. And three months later, we got an order from Judge Price finding that the cases had all been reversed. You know why they were reversed? Because they did not take a warrant and put that into evidence. So she said there was not anything that they could have been tried for. So we won all of our cases. As if that wasn't a sign of time, you know, uh, why was it you went back and forth every day? Because there was no hotel that we could be admitted to to sleep in. There was no restaurant that we could eat in, so we had to take lunches up there. Now, Judge Howell, what changes have you seen during your career to improve access to justice, especially for the poor? Well, everybody been looking back over the last 50 years has talked about how far we've come, but we all recognize how far we still have to go. I think that the uh, main thing that we've seen has given improved access to justice on the criminal side uh, is another 50th anniversary and that's uh, Gideon B. Wainwright, written by Alabama's own Hugo Black. In that case, in, in 1963, in March, the Supreme Court held for the first time that anyone charged with a felony in state court was entitled to representation of counsel, uh, which was pretty radical. Before that, uh, defendants in capital cases, Powell versus Alabama, had been entitled to, to a representation, but not otherwise. So that really revolutionized things. Uh, the Birmingham Bar rose to that challenge by requiring all of our lawyers to volunteer to represent uh, criminal defendants. Now, I'll never forget Mr. Douglas Aram, uh, probably the most prominent lawyer in Birmingham at the time, Bradley Aram, volunteered, came to the courthouse, tried a criminal case and got a not guilty verdict. Well, when they realized that the lawyers were taking this pretty seriously, uh, they realized that we had to find another way of providing representation for the team. And at that time, we switched to an appointing system. Our criminal judges would appoint volunteer lawyers to represent individual criminal defendants. Uh, that method has continued up until this day but I am very pleased to say that the 1st of January, uh, we are changing our system and have a new public defender's office. Uh, my hope is that uh, my hope is that uh, it will provide better representation for indigent defendants at less cost to the taxpayers. Now, I think. Uh, some of the appointed lawyers have done a great job representing their clients. Others uh, meet their clients for the first time when that case is set for trial on Monday morning and uh, simply enter a guilty plea and send their bill to the state of payment. So I think that this new system uh, will work. Uh, we have rented offices. We are now in the process of hiring lawyers. And I can anticipate that before long, that the public defender's office will almost mirror the 
district attorney's office because about 90% of our defendants are indigent and qualified for representation. Now, the civil side, there is not a right to counsel. Uh, what's been done on the civil side? Well, I wish there were a right to counsel. If you think about the consequences of some civil litigation, they're about as serious for the parties as criminal uh, cases on. In a domestic relations case, nothing's more important than custody or disposition of your home or conviction uh, from a home in foreclosure. There is no constitutional right to counsel in those cases. The Birmingham Bar has a program called the Birmingham Bar Volunteer Lawyers Program, and we just revised it uh, in the last few years. And it is doing a wonderful job. What we're doing is there are many young lawyers out there who want to try cases. <coughs> Most litigation has gotten so expensive that very few cases are actually being tried. So we've got these young lawyers who want to be trial lawyers. We've got this vast pool of people over here who desperately need civil representation. So the purpose of our volunteer lawyers program is to train these lawyers to represent these people and to get this supply with this demand. Uh, and it's working very well. Right now, over 2,000 of our Jefferson County lawyers have volunteered for that. <coughs> and it's, uh, it's working. We've still got a long way to go. But uh, I think that's one of the great improvements we've seen. And many of the courtrooms in our state reflect the communities that they are representing. Mm -hmm. But there are several in our state that do not. There's a, there's a difference. Judge Bow was telling us mainly about the state courts. The federal courts have set up a federal defender office and it mirrors the U.S. Attorney's office. That's needed because in Alabama, have any of you read a book called Slavery by Another Name? It tells a gruesome story. Back in the early part of the 20th century, the late 19th century, on up until the 20s, 1920. In the state system, you would have defendants who were found guilty. They were fined. These people couldn't pay a fine. So they would lease out by the state of Alabama to the iron company, the ore mine, the coal mine, and the conditions that they live under are too bad to even think about. That convict lease system was around for many, many years, and is one of the bad spots on the legal system in the state of Alabama. So with the indigent defendants and with the, the defendant system that has been instituted by the courts, I think we are moving away from where we came from. The, let me say too, uh, Mason, the, uh, the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Alabama has just adopted within the last two years a public defender's office. Uh, that public defender is being a tremendous help to us on the state court side in setting our program up. Uh, it's just been amazing to see uh, the federal courts and the state courts working so well together to provide uh, this needed service. I read an article in the Really, it's an editorial in the New York Times. August of 26, 2013. I'm going to take a little bit of time to read portions of this article. Observers of the federal court system 
cannot recall the last time such a thing has happened, if it ever has. Chief judges in 86 of the 94 federal district courts around the country, more than half of them Republican appointees, have now joined to sound an alarm about the grave damage to the nation's justice system caused by years of black financing followed by Washington's lunatic across the board budget cuts known as sequestration. The cuts have also put the public safety at risk by reducing the number of probation and pretrial services offices available to supervise defendants awaiting trial and individuals released into the community after serving time in prison for serious crime. The judges expressed particular concern about the crippling reduction in the funds available for drug, mental health, sex offender treatment, programs and for drug testing and electronics and GPS monitoring of offenders. These moves were necessary, that is, the reduction of the money. These moves were necessary, but they will make it harder to recruit able private lawyers to do indigent criminal defense work. They set up the system, but because of sequestration, because of the budget, the lawyers are not going to be paid at the rate that they formerly were, and so you're going to have a hard time to get a lawyer to take the case for an indigent person. And if you think the reduction of funding is bad for the feds, you ought to look at what's happening to the Alabama courts. Every year since 03, our appropriations have declined. And every time they have declined, we lose employees. We have cut back. We, we tried uh, something called remediation courts to try to stop recidivism by getting to the root cause of a lot of these crimes. We've had domestic violence court, we've had drug court, we've had mental health court, and other specialty courts, and the funding for those has dried up. We're essentially doing away with them again. So the public needs to be aware of the serious consequences of the lack of funding for the courts. The, the Alabama Constitution, flawed though it is, says the legislature shall provide adequate funding for the courts. In some states, the courts are actually suing the legislature or the government. Uh, I don't think that's a very good way to uh, cooperate among the three branches of the government. But we've got to do something to make the people aware of the consequences to all of us of the lack of funding for the courts. Uh, without it, um, there are an awful lot of defendants that are unable to pay a lawyer because of poverty. Poverty has caused a great number of them, in fact, almost every one of them, to drop out of school. When I was in school at Talladega, I looked out the window one day high school right across from the building where I was taking this course from. One of the guys who came here from Germany, his name was Dr. Rasma. I asked him, why are those kids out of school? And his answer to me was, they're hungry. They're hungry. If they're hungry, they can't go to school and learn. So you get a kid from a poor family who goes to school, he can't learn, he drops out. When he drops out, he's got to earn a living, he's got to eat. So he goes and he starts selling drugs. He sells drugs, the policeman arrests him, he goes to court, the next thing, he's in prison. He stays in prison for a while, and he's released, and they give him $50 on a bus ticket, he 
come back to Birmingham. You've got a prison record. You can't get a job. So the next thing he does, he goes back on the farm. He starts selling drugs again, and he winds up in the penitentiary again. I know we're preaching to the choir a lot right here, but you know, what, what is probably one of the most important things that we can do as a society to help break the cycle of addiction to crime and to do injustice? Well, Mason's hit it on the head, and it's the purpose of this organization. It was probably just the root cause of so many of these things. But I think that one of the solutions is to adequately fund the court so that we can use these remediation courts to try to bring all the social services together instead of just this endless cycle of crime, conviction, penitentiary, release, crime, just over and over with the same people we see day after day charged with the same thing. There's no getting out of that unless we change our system. And the system can be changed, uh, I think, only, only throughout the country. And of course, that gets into Alabama's tax system, which we don't have time to go into. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions before we wrap this up? I'd like to say Scott's done a great job downtown. Thank you, Steve. Hey. without somebody saying something, something. I'm right back. With Alabama Appleseed, my question goes to the issue of funding of the courts. Um, and one of the problems right now, and I don't intend to get into a specific case, is that the uh, uh, there's an institution that uh, takes charges against judges, and if they're found, then they charge those judges. This happened a couple of years ago with the current chief justice. And, and that body is about ready to lose its only prosecutor. And as, and as a state, we will no longer be able to take misbehaving judges or judges that ought not be on the bench um, and, and to try them. And, and if that continues to be the case, my question to you too is how is that going to reflect on the, on the judiciary and the legal profession as a whole? Well, I'd like to respond to that if I may. Um, it is. We, we have a very ineffectual method in place for disciplining our judges. That is made even worse by the way we select our judges, by uh, partisan elections. We're getting people on the bench who are simply not qualified to be on the bench for a lot of reasons. But uh, the uh, doing away with the prosecutor Judicial Inquiry Commission will, in effect, uh, do away with the only policing we have. And uh, we all know that without threat of being caught, that people tend to do bad things. So I'm, I'm very disturbed about it, and hopefully um, the Chief Justice will do something to get some money there, although he is not too fond of the current system. <laughs> Anything else? Um, you said earlier that uh, you were preaching to the choir sort of in this room. Um, I think probably everyone in this room is real concerned and talks and thinks a lot about the recidivism issue and what it costs the state of uh, Alabama and opportunity costs to what these people could be doing if they weren't going in and out of jail. My question is, what do you say to people that you encounter who still think the way that a lot of people thought 40 years ago, that this is the natural state of things? How do you convince people that it's in their interest, that they're not people like us who care about these issues anyway, um, that, they should make a, that they should make a change so that we don't have productive citizens in prison all the time? Well, I think Eric Holder made a great step forward last week pointed out to people that this doesn't mean you're soft on crime. 
or that you're turning dangerous people loose on society. It simply means that we've got to use better judgment in the way we uh, combat lawlessness. Um, it costs $5 a day to monitor somebody in drug court. That's a program where they let them out, they're tested randomly and make sure they're clean. They make sure they have jobs and when, and if it's a nonviolent crime, when they complete that program, the charges are dismissed so that person doesn't have to live the rest of his or her life with that record. But with, without that, you're spending $50 a day to keep these same people in jail where they're not learning any trades, they're not learning anything other than uh, other ways to get in trouble. So it's just a matter of dollar and cents, if nothing else, even if you put the humanitarian uh, issues aside. Why do you think that that message is so far from something that needs to be said? Well, I think it's lacking. So it's lack of funding by the by the courts. We had that money uh, taken away from us by the county commission, and we know the shape they're in. They're in bankruptcy for crying out loud. So they don't have the fifty dollars. $5 a day, and therefore they stay in jail for $50. The county doesn't have the money because in the Constitution, home rule is denied to the county, to the city. And because of that, you've got to rely on a legislature to do something about the taxation system. All of us know that they don't want to do anything with the ad valorem taxation of land. And that's where the money comes from. I think I'm sort of making the point that I think prejudice is still very much alive and well, unfortunately, 50 years after the speech that Montgomery's prejudice gets thrown in hand, and there are plenty of people who are still prejudiced about the Well, lock them up. Lock them up for a way. It is a populist message, and that's unfortunately what passes for political education too often in the state. Johnny, right? Yeah, what is back there, guys? And uh, the people have been so adverse uh, to the concept of county home rule, not as it just as it relates to Jefferson County, but the fundamental issue in our Constitution that prohibits that uh, constitutional right for the legislature to give us home rule if we can go to sleep. There, there are many reasons. One is that if you give home rule to the county, the county is able to have an election to change the taxation law. The folks in Montgomery that allow that to happen will say, they're not going to do anything with that money but throw it away. They'll give it to people on welfare and that's one of the things that gets in folks mind money goes to welfare ad valorem system could be changed and that would help the, the educational system but i don't think that everybody in the state wants us to have a good education Lenora, you know full well that uh, as the records clearly state from the 1901 constitutional proceedings, a stated purpose was to prevent counties with black majorities from having home rule. I mean, they, they were just quite open about it, and we're still stuck with that philosophy. And so the, the system that we 
have today is rooted in our 1901 Constitution, it seems to be, both in every area of the issues that we're talking about. And they were so smart, they just uh, sealed it in concrete. It's, it's so hard to change it. I believe we are the last southern state to be living under its turn of the century during the 20th century constitution. The, the Bourbonistic constitution. Yeah. Lenora, we, we thank you for all the good work you're doing. No, I thank you, Tom. Yeah. Okay, well with that, I think we should all have safe travels home. So one of the things that's on your table, you may have noticed the postcard, um, the words on the front are words that came from our community conversation series that we did during 2011 and 2012. We asked people what opportunities we had to end poverty in Alabama. Um, on the back, we're asking you, what will you do today to make Alabama a better place for all people to so I'm going to ask you to write a promise to yourself and leave it on the table. And we're going to mail it to you in about a month. So you can see if you follow through and remind yourself of some of the things that we learned from the discussion tonight. I want to thank you again for coming out and supporting our work with Alabama Possible. Um, and I want to thank Mason and Eric and Scott, who spent a lot of time preparing for this evening, and I want to thank them for their insight and wisdom. And Y'all have a great night. Thank you.